So welcome everyone to Black and White in Black and White, uh, presented to us today by Holly Berg, the curator of exhibits for the City of Greeley Museums. Um, as it says here, the, the exhibition subtitle is Images of Dignity, Hope, and Diversity in America. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Holly. Thank you, Holly. Carly, thanks for that introduction. It's so, so great to be here. Um, some of you hopefully caught my earlier presentation a few months ago about the unmentionable exhibit that we have on display currently here at the Greeley History Museum. This one is gonna replace that exhibit as that one closes. So it's a little bit of a teaser. It's not quite open yet. You can see on the screen, it says it opens February 17th. So if you wanna catch the unmentionable exhibit, be sure to make it in before it closes on February 5th. But it is great to be here. As Charlie mentioned, my name is Holly Berg and I am the curator of exhibits for the City of Greeley Museums. Where I am today, it is cold and snowy, so I hope wherever you are, you're staying warm and dry. But I appreciate you all joining me today. We, of course, to talk about the upcoming exhibit, Black and White in Black and White, Images of Dignity, Hope, and Diversity in America. So as a little treat, we also have a companion exhibit that ties into this traveling exhibit called Faces of Deerfield, the Faces of Deerfield. And it's already open and it will remain open through the duration of the black and white uh, exhibit as well. So this exhibit uh, features artwork done by local artist, Julie Vaught. She was very inspired by original images taken in the town of Deerfield. And she was so inspired that she decided to paint uh, portraits of the residents that she saw represented in those images. For those of you who may not be familiar with the City of Greeley Museums, we operate four different historical sites throughout the city, and that's city, the Centennial Village Museum, Greeley History Museum, the Meeker Home Museum, and the White Plum Farm Learning Center. Now these exhibits will be open at the Greeley History Museum that's located at 714 8th Street in downtown Greeley. I encourage you to pop by and give us a visit. And of course, there's the website listed in the bottom right of the screen if you want any more information. So, Just a quick note before we dive into the topic at hand today. So you may hear or see some outdated terminology during this presentation, but it is only used in reference to primary sources and it is not used by myself or the City of Greeley Museums in any other context. So as the curator of exhibits, I am responsible for planning all the exhibits that we host here in, in the Greeley Museums, but most particularly in the Greeley History Museum. So we host two types of exhibits, and that's in-house exhibits and traveling exhibits. So in-house exhibits are displays that we do all of the work for, from the topic selection to the planning and the research, um, image selection, artifact selection, design, fabrication, installation, all of the steps in the process. But with traveling exhibits, they are put together by a different organization or museum or institution and then sent to us and we unbox them and then install them in the gallery. So back when we were working on this year's schedule, which feels like so long ago now, we came across this traveling exhibit, black and white in black and white. And we knew it would be amazing to host it. So this exhibit is curated by Douglas Keister and traveled by the company called Exhibit Envoy. And it showcases primarily striking portraits of African-American residents of Lincoln, Nebraska between about 1910 and 1926. Now, because we are a mission-driven organization and our mission is to preserve and interpret local history, meaning Greeley and Weld County, and then extrapolated to the High Plains. We make, we try to make sure that every traveling exhibit has a connection to our local history so that we continue to meet our mission. So when we, my team and I uh, presented this exhibit to our board and our experience team, um, who's responsible for finalizing the exhibit selection and schedule, 
the whole team got really excited about it because we knew we had an awesome local collection connection, excuse me, which is the story of Deerfield, which was a primarily African-American settlement founded in 1910 by entrepreneur O.T. Jackson. You can see him pictured right here. And of course, 1910, that's around the same time as the earliest photographs in this traveling exhibit were taken. But of course, the time frame is only one of the similarities between the portraits in this exhibit and the Deerfield story. So being that they happened in the same time, they, that meant they happened in the same national context. What was going on across the country affected both Lincoln, Nebraska and Deerfield, and that was the New Negro Movement. Also, another similarity is that images in the traveling exhibit are quite striking. I think you'll find that throughout this presentation. And the images taken in Deerfield are equally striking and touching, both portray a dignity and a kind of hope for the future. And even the story of how the collections came to be are quite similar, which leads us to the story of the Keister collection, which is the one on display in the traveling exhibit. So picture this, take you back a little bit. The year's 1965 and Douglas, or Doug as he was called, was a junior in high school in Lincoln, Nebraska. He already had a keen interest in photography and a love of history and putting those two together, a love of the history of photography. Doug also had a friend who was also named Doug, Doug Boylison, who also had a love of history and a particular fondness for collecting memorabilia related to the phonograph, the things like that. Those probably look kind of familiar. So one day, Doug Boylison was at a garage sale and something caught his eye. It was an old glass plate negative with what happened to be an image of a young girl standing next to a phonograph. So he went nuts and he bought the whole stack of glass plate negatives. Doug Keister was also interested in the plates given his love of the history of photography and he offered to buy them from Doug Boylison. So Doug Boylison kept the glass plate negative that had the image of the girl with the phonograph, but he sold Doug Keister the rest of the stack. So in case you need a refresher on glass plate negatives, here's a picture from uh, an example from our collection at the City of Greeley Museums. So glass plate negatives, of course, they're made of glass. They're kind of brittle, pretty fragile. Um, they are used in antique or old cameras to capture images, just like film. They're typically about five by seven. And like film negatives, they can be hard to see, um, as with the example on the left, um, unless you hold them up to the light or make a scan or a print. And we did just that for the image on the right. When Kaiser came into possession of this stack of glass plate negatives, he made some contact prints right away. And that means prints the same size as the negatives. He did not enlarge the first ones. And those revealed some of the striking port portraits on the rest of them. And later he sold some enlargements of the photos to interested buyers. But pretty soon he moved to California and became a professional photographer and he kept the plates in a little shoebox under his bed or in storage. And there they stayed for a while. And now we're gonna fast forward to March of 1999 and a similar collection of glass plates came in to the Nebraska State Historical Society. And an article was written about that collection in the local paper. Now, Doug Keister's mother came across that newspaper article and sent it to him with a simple note asking if he still had that collection of glass plate negatives. So he did, and he partnered up with the researchers at the Nebraska State Historical Society they all examined his glass plates and determined that they were images taken by the same photographer. And this is really where Doug Heiser's research journey began. He and the fellow researchers and historians at the Nebraska State Historical Society, they poured over the images and dove into the historical records to uncover as many details 
about both the photographer and the subjects as possible. So this brings us to researching historical mysteries. So I'm gonna let you in on just a, a few of our quote unquote industry secrets. The first industry secret is that historians and researchers love a mystery. And on second thought, that's actually not much of a secret. So part of our jobs, part of our passions, part of our hobbies is to combine all sorts of different sources in order to create a fuller picture or a story on a topic. You might be thinking back to your high school history classes. You might be wondering, how many sources we have and how we document them. And sources, historical sources can come from a wide variety of things. Um, you can tease out any sort of little vital piece of information that will help you just place that last piece of the puzzle and create a big complete story. So I won't read all of them, but I have some of the sources that we regularly consult. Um, listed up on the screen right now. So the next industry secret I'm going to let you in on is that there's a technique in museum education. It's called visual thinking strategies. Now, it's primarily a technique used to encourage tour groups and, and school kids to closely examine the work on display. And the questions that the, the docents or the tour guides ask the groups are what's going on in this work? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can you find? And really there's, there's no wrong answer there. And the job of the docent or the tour guide is to connect people's answers to paint a larger context and larger story about the piece on display. Now, though this is primarily used for museum education and tour groups, it's also a fantastic place to start on a research journey. And that's exactly what the team at the Nebraska State Historical Society and Keister did. So I'll give you a few examples here about how they pieced some clues together. So their first major clue here came from Ruth Talbert, who's the little girl in this photo. And this photo is titled The Talbert Family. It will be on display, of course, without the copyright line um, in our gallery in the exhibit. Talbert was a local resident in Nebraska and Lincoln, and she got connected with the research team at the Nebraska State Historical Society. And she reported that she remembered an African-American man named John Johnson as the photographer who took this picture. And that provided a major breakthrough for the team. So based on just that name alone, they started pouring over all the other resources that they had on hand, like all the ones listed a couple slides ago, um, like census records, documents, and this led them to a booklet John Johnson wrote titled The Negro History of Lincoln, 1888 to 1938. And these sources, when you put them all together, revealed the story of his life. So this is John Johnson right here. He was born in 1879 in Lincoln, Nebraska in the house that his father built. He was well-educated. He graduated from Lincoln High School and attended the University of Nebraska. But at the time, even for educated African-American people, employment was largely restricted to labor or service and the same rang true for Johnson. Sources listed his employment as a drayman, meaning a cart or wagon driver, a laborer and a janitor at the post office or later the courthouse as well. But we also know from this collection that he was an accomplished photographer. And we know that this photography was more than a hobby for him. Thinking about the equipment that he would have used at the time, it was large, it was heavy. He didn't operate in a studio, so he had a lot of dedication to lug this stuff around with him. A lot of it was also pretty expensive. Glass plates, you could only use one per image. They were pretty fragile and they were pretty expensive, so he had to have quite a few with him. Also, a lot of the images in this exhibit reveal that he was dedicated to his craft. 
there are some really amazing photography techniques evident in the photos on display as well. And just the sheer number of plates and photographs that we found attributed to him show that this was not just a hobby. This was more like a profession. He was a very accomplished photographer. So far, there have been over 500 glass plate negatives attributed to him. So that was their first major break, finding out all this information about the photographer. So in the next example here, they examined this image. So they were able to enlarge the image really, really big. And that was possible because they had the original plate negative. And that allowed them to examine all sorts of details in this image. And of course, they thought through the three questions that we talked about earlier used in visual thinking strategies. And that revealed a lot of useful detail for the team. So taking a quick glance at this image, of course, there's a woman reading on a porch plate. Um, but looking a little bit closer, the woman is wearing all white. She appears to be dressed up a bit. She's a bit fancy, notice her earrings. Looking at her left hand, you also notice a small wedding band. And if you zoom in really, really close, um, as they could with the enlargement, you can see that she's reading a copy of the periodical or the magazine called Ladies Home Journal. So with all of this detail, the team was able to go back through the archives of the Ladies Home Journal and they matched the cover art um, to a particular issue with this one. And that issue was published in August of 1918. So putting together all of those clues, the fact that she's wearing white, she has a wedding band, the date of the magazine, they were able to conclude that this woman in the picture is the photographer's wife, Odessa Price Johnson, and that she, they think she may be wearing her wedding dress. And uh, census records and other records um, state that John Johnson and Odessa were married on August 20th, 1918. So that's another example of how just looking very closely um, and paying a lot of good attention can piece together more of the story. Well, let's take an example here. They enlarged this photograph as well. And this revealed a date. It's not quite a specific date range, but they got a good idea of date here. So again, taking a quick glance, you see a home decorated for Christmas. The research team thinks it's probably a home of uh, German immigrants. But if you look closer, there are two books that are presents under the tree. They're called Phil the Showman and there's an elephant on the cover there, and then Frisky Squirrel Story. So looking into the original publication dates of these books, the team learned that they were first published in 1902 and 1906, respectively. So this photo had to have at least been captured in December 1906, but they're thinking it was probably a bit later. The Nebraska team repeated this research process and so did Keister himself so many times with all of the image, um, all of the images featured in the exhibition, but unfortunately I don't have time to cover all of them today. So we're gonna get into the local connection to the traveling exhibit, which is the Deerfield story. Like Johnson's work in Lincoln, there's also a large collection of photographs, documents, and research that reveals the inspiring story of the town of Deerfield, Colorado. Inspired by Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery, Oliver Toussaint, called O.T. Jackson, firmly believed that the path to true freedom and economic independence for African Americans had its roots in agriculture. So he acted on this belief in this dream, and in May 1910, he filed for 320 acres of homestead land, homestead land about 25 miles east of Greeley. And after that, he was also a marketer, so he spread word far and wide that the new town was ready for residents. And within a year, seven families called Deerfield home. Some sources say the town's motto was, when we build, let us think that we build forever. 
And there's actually a, a really long paragraph that makes you just want to stand up and say yes at the end of it when you read it. But most sources say that this first sentence was the town motto. The town flourished during and after World War I. Crop prices were really high because of the war and the rain provided more than enough water. It was an unusually rainy time in that, that, at that time in the climate. And the population swelled to 700 people in 1921. Residents grew over a dozen different crops like the melons you see in this cute little photo here. And life at Deerfield came with a lot of hard work as any life on a farm, but also plenty of fun. The community came together to hold dances every Saturday. They planned picnics, they organized hunting and fishing trips. Visitors traveled from all over the state to participate in the annual Labor Day picnic and various rodeos and festivals. The town became known to travelers along Highway 34, which was the Lincoln Highway at the time, because of the iconic buildings of the gas station and the lunchroom right off the highway. And it was the only gas station between Greeley and Fort Morgan, so it was a very popular stop for travelers. But all too soon, the crop prices fell the economy collapsed and the drought made it harder to grow crops. The combination of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl meant that many residents abandoned the town and moved back to the larger cities. And by 1940, the census recorded the population at only 12 people. O.T. Jackson, his wife Minerva, and his niece Jenny held on to that dream until the end. After Minerva's death in 1942 and Jackson's in 48, um, and one of the earliest residents um, stayed in town until 1951 at his death. Um, but after that, Jenny became the only resident of Deerfield until she moved to Greeley several, several years later because of medical issues. There is an original picture of a dust storm taken out at Deerfield. You can see how that just ravaged the crops and the buildings out there. There's Jenny standing in front of the Jackson's house, um, also used as the Deerfield Lodge. So of course, piecing this story together in, in much more detail is possible because of all of the resources and the research that's already been compiled by dedicated researchers. I won't read all of that there on the slide, but you can look through that. And the earliest researcher that I know of is Dr. Margaret Pitcher, and she was able to connect with a lot of the original residents. And she's one of the main reasons why we have so many pictures and information available as we do today. And of course, the um, present day, considered the present day experts of uh, on the subject of deer, deer fields are Dr. Robert Brunswick and George June, Dr. George June, who have conducted archaeological studies at the site with teams from the University of Northern Colorado. So using all of these sources as clues, I'd like to introduce you to a few of the residents out at Deerfield and just skim the surface of their amazing stories. And I'll start with O.T. and Minerva Jackson. So they're considered the founding family of Deerfield. O.T. was born in Oxford, Ohio in 1862, and he moved to the Denver Boulder area in about 1887 and started several businesses there, including a restaurant, catering business, a resort, and later a small farm. But he always dreamed of creating a town. Minerva was born in Missouri in 1873 and became a school teacher and taught there for 15 years and then came to Colorado and married O.T. on July 14, 1905. When Deerfield was founded, O.T. served as a messenger for the Colorado governor's office, which was quite an honor at the time, and he worked with several different administrations, which meant that he was frequently in Denver. He didn't spend very much time in the town at all. A one oral history interview recorded with a resident of a nearby town says that he remembered that O.T. was always dressed very professionally, even when he was helping on the farms and fields around town. I mean, you can see that in the photo on the slide here. He was almost always in a three-piece suit. 
Minerva became the anchor of the town, running the gas station, the lunchroom, and doing lots and lots of other chores too. We have some photographs of her raising chickens and doing other things like that. In one letter, O.T. wrote to a friend, he reported that Minerva had become the judge for the town in all matters, business and personal, and that everyone respected her decisions. Minerva's obituary, which is another great source, also stated that she, quote, became widely known for her business acumen and her kindly counsel. Many persons and institutions have benefited from her private philanthropy. O.T. and Minerva lived in the town and held out hope until the end that people would come back and the town would come life back to life after the depression um, up until they both passed away. Two people also inspired the artist Julie Vaught and you can see these are her portraits of them and they are hanging in the Faces of Deerfield exhibit at the moment. The next residents I want you to meet are Hattie and Charles Rothwell. A lot about their story from a transcript of an interview that Charles did later in his life. He told the interviewer all about their lives. Um, of course, Hattie was his mother. So Hattie Bell Graves Rothwell, she was tough, she was independent, and she was devoted to her family. So she came to Denver by train around 1889. Her husband Henry worked in construction and he helped to build the Brown Palace, which probably sounds familiar, you may know that in Denver, and also one of the first Denver General Hospitals. But Henry was also abusive and Hattie decided to leave him. She began doing laundry and washing work for several white families around town to support herself and her children. When the economy declined in 1893, Hattie was very savvy and she took advantage of the low prices and bought several lots of land around Denver. Charles remembered that her motto was, quote, own the ground, own the ground. She built their house for about $500 and raised vegetables, horses, hogs, cows, and chickens to supplement their income. And Hattie met O.T. Jackson while doing laundry for the governor, and she quickly realized the opportunities and the escape that Deerfield offered. Charles remembered, quote, I went to sixth grade in Montclair School in Denver till it, meaning prejudice, racism, and fights at the school, got so bad that I went to Homestead and in Deerfield. So Hattie took out a loan on her Denver house, bought supplies and animals, and boarded the train with Charles. And they arrived in the middle of a terrible blizzard and actually lived on the train car for a few weeks until they could get out and um, trudge through the snow. But once the snow melted, they were able to build their house in just one day. And Hattie and Charles grew their own crops, including cucumbers that they sold to the Cuner Pickle Company. And she also took on work with local white families. Charles became a cowhand for local ranchers, and, but Hattie soon fell ill and returned to Denver. But Charles stayed in Deerfield for many years and made a name for himself as a rodeo cowboy. Um, but he got pretty injured during a rodeo in Cheyenne and stopped competing. He did serve in World War I, but he was not sent overseas. But after that, just like many people across the country, he had trouble finding work. Um, but he finally found a position as a Pullman porter and worked for the railroad for the next 28 years. These two people also inspired artist Julie Vaught, and those are their portraits right there, also hanging in the Faces of Deerfield exhibit. The next resident I would like you to meet is Squire Brockman. He's the gentleman standing on the left of this image. Census data tells us that Squire Brockman was born in Missouri in 1873 to parents Hiram and Nancy Brockman, and that he was one of six children. From Missouri, he made his way to Kansas, and he lived there for a while until he made his way to Deerfield um, around 18, 1918. His draft card from World War I, also a fantastic source, military records and draft cards, uh, they described him as medium height, medium build, and he had black eyes and black hair. And it listed his occupation as farming and blacksmithing. 
Soon after arriving in the town, he rented the blacksmith shop and garage in town, and he ran his business from that location for decades. It was situated right off the highway, Lincoln Highway, now Highway 34, to take advantage of the travelers between Greeley and Fort Morgan. And he also had a reputation for being a great fiddler, and he would get together with his brother-in-law, who played the mandolin to entertain the residents at, at gatherings and I presume on their Saturday dances. And he's the early resident I mentioned earlier. He stayed in town until his death in 1951. He became the, the longest staying early resident. Well, the last resident I'd like to introduce to you today is Dr. W.A. Jones or Wade A. Jones. He was among the first residents of the new town of Deerfield. He was a native of Alabama and he graduated from the Tuskegee Institute before coming to Colorado. He served as a physician to both the residents of Deerfield and the people from the surrounding communities. Records state that he accepted patients, quote, regardless of their race or income. And when business was slow, he also grew crops on his land around town. We have some fun pictures of him hitching up horses and putting um, down his hay. So and this is the portrait that Julie Bott painted of him, of course, based on the original, original uh, image in the last slide. So that's just a, a taste, that's just not even skimming the surface of the amazing stories of the Deerfield residents. Just like the John Johnson photographs, there are so many more stories that make up the whole story of Deerfield. And of course, the Johnson photographs and Deerfield, we want to preserve them as much as possible. We do not want to lose them. And of course, their stories live on through all of the research and just talking about them as we're doing today. So Doug Heister and the Nebraska State Historical Society wanted to preserve and share the story of John Johnson and the Lincoln residents featured in his photos. So of course they created this exhibit, but that doesn't mean that the research is over by any means. They continue their search for more clues about the collection even up to today. And Johnson's work is also featured in the, both the permanent and temporary exhibitions in Smithsonian institutions. Um, Keister also put together a documentary that's a really cool watch. It's available on YouTube. It's called Shadows on Glass. And I recommend you all go and watch it. It'll also be on display in the exhibit as well. And of course, the effort to preserve Deerfield and all of its stories is also it also lives on um, unfortunately the town sat vacant for several decades and you might have even seen it driving east of Greeley to Fort Morgan many of the buildings deteriorated they were exposed to the elements and the wind they weren't protected and many of them collapsed this image here is the lunchroom it is still standing but it needs some it needs some love um, the Deerfield Preservation Committee and the Deerfield Dream Project, which is a project um, that is an out outgrowth of that committee, was formally organized in 2008 with the mission of preserving and sharing the story of Deerfield. And it includes collaborators and stakeholders from the Black American West Museum and Heritage Center in Denver, the University of Northern Colorado, City of Greeley Museums, and many other stakeholders. And I was very honored to be invited to join the committee a few months ago. So we've been, we've been doing lots of fun work. Um, we are actively working on securing grants and carrying out grant projects to preserve the site and eventually create interpretive materials to tell um, the story and install them at the site out there. And our, our, I'm excited to announce our first committee newsletter just went out. If you're interested in seeing that, please let me know. And of course, oh, I forgot. This is um, our committee's new logo, so that's exciting. And of course, who could forget the wonderful Crabtree Brewery in town? They've been brewing their Deerfield Ale for many years now. And of course, the pro portion of the proceeds go to supporting the town's preservation. So if you have a chance, I would encourage you to go out there and have a Deerfield Ale too. 
So it seems like the historical mysteries to solve and the stories to uncover never ever run out, but unfortunately my time for this program does. So I encourage you to ch come check out the exhibit and see many, many more of these intriguing stories on display. So I guess that does it for me. And we do have some time, I think, for questions, Charlie, if you would like to facilitate that. Yes, gladly. Um, I have a couple of my own, but I will, I will hold off. If someone else has a, a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, fire away. Okay, folks might be a little bashful, so I'm telling you what, I'm going to ask a couple of questions myself, and then if that's for okay. something. Um, although I see Gary, it looks like you are unmuted. Do you have a question? Well, this is actually Donna. I want to Donna. Him, but that's all right. Um, is anyone uh, still uh, alive that lived in Deerfield and living in our area? Question. I believe that some of the last residents have passed away, but it wasn't that many years ago. There was a family that moved in in 1939 to actually the building that was used as the grocery store. Um, and there was a very recent interview that was conducted with them. I'm not quite sure whether they are still living, but I don't think so. Okay, thank you. So my, so my first question for you, Holly, you had mentioned uh, the idea of the, the new Negro. Could you, could you expand on that a little bit? So um, the text in the traveling exhibit talks much more, much more in detail about the movement, but the new Negro movement, it was a national movement that um, is pretty much attributed to starting in the um, early 1900s, about 1916. And it was a movement that aimed to combat the country's perception of, quote, the old Negro. They were um, portrayed in popular um, literature and popular programs at the time as, you know, lazy and uneducated. Um, but instead, this movement championed the idea of the new Negro who was intelligent, who was literate, who was educated and refined, sophisticated, fashionable. And that was part of um, the movement trying to allow African-American citizens to move into the middle class and to affect change by um, changing some of the restrictive laws and, and prejudice practices. Thank you. Um, another question I had, um, you had mentioned that um, Johnson did not have his, his own studio. Um, and I know there were some studios around that time in Washington, DC, but how, how prevalent were they? I mean, how, how rare is this that, that there were African-American photography studios? Question. I don't know the statistics on that off the top of my head. I would have to do some research. But I do know that at the turn of the century, photography was a very expensive and rather complicated hobby. And, or even not a hobby, but a profession even. The cameras available at the time were large. They were clunky. They had a lot to learn about them in terms of settings and, um, Things that you could change to focus your image, tilt your image, change the orientation. It wasn't quite as, as slick and sophisticated as our cameras today. You would really have to know how to use your camera. You'd spend a lot of time on it. And not only that, but you just like photography today, you would want to buy the best camera you could, which were expensive, but also the lenses and the film, the glass plates um, to go all along with it. Those were pretty expensive. And um, given that the cameras were so big and clunky, they were usually confined to a studio. Um, not many people, I think, took them out and about. You had to be pretty dedicated to do that. 
Um, but then at the turn of the century, of course, Kodak was the one who championed inventing a streamlined camera so that photography was accessible to the masses. They came out with their brownie in uh, the little box camera in 1900 and the number two brownie in the next year. And then, of course, they had all sorts of folding cameras and vest pocket cameras that really aimed to make everything more accessible. They were also cheaper and the film was cheaper. So in terms of how accessible it was, people might have even been pressed, um, priced out of owning photography equipment. Interesting. Do we have any other questions from uh, the attendees? Bethany. Have you been able to get in touch with any of the descendants of the residents of Deerfield? Yeah, Deerfield. Um, you know, that's a, a good question. I personally myself have not. I would be very interested to see if um, the University of Northern Colorado archives or even the um, archeological um, teams have connected or even the Black American West Museum have connected with the descendants. I know that the Weld County Genealogical Society has put a call out calling for descendants, but I don't know if they've been able to connect with anybody. Okay. Okay, if you are interested in kind of volunteering or anything to help with moving the uh, discoveries and follow the discoveries and moving this forward, how would you, um, who would you contact or how oh, would you get involved? Well, absolutely, that's a great question. So, um, the teams from UNC generally lead archaeological excavations each summer, um, and I can I can put you in contact with that. But if you're looking for kind of all the latest news about the Deerfield Committee and our work and the projects and all the different ways you can get involved, um, I mentioned we also just. Um, published our first newsletter. So we've been trying to put a whole bunch of information in there. So if you would like, I can put the link to the newsletter in our chat. And then when you open that in the browser, you should have an option to subscribe also. Would oh, you like that me? would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can access it here. But in the meantime, if anybody else has a question, feel free to fire away. Okay, I have a comment more so than a question, and that wow. comment is that the detective work that gets done on some of these from these photographs is is just amazing. So not only tracking down the fact that it was Johnson's wife in that photo, but finding which periodical she was reading and what the cover date of it was, um, and then tracing it back and seeing that, oh my goodness, that is the week of her wedding. So that makes sense that that's her wedding dress. That's a uh, that's just amazing. And uh, that puts a smile on my face. Isn't it great? Yeah, I, I read somewhere, uh, don't quote me on it, but I read somewhere that the Keister has been doing this research on and off for the last 50 years. And I mean, I believe it, the amount of detail that is written on the labels that go with each image is just incredible. Still working on pulling up that URL here. Just a second. We can always send it out, um, you know, sort of as a follow-up email to the registrants too, if that if that'll work. It's just able to bring it up. So, following that link should get you to the first issue of our newsletter. And then it should open and there should be a button to subscribe up in the top left. That really is the best way, the best way to keep up on everything that's happening because 
I know a few professors are doing a conference session related to Deerfield, and then uh, there's a conference coming up, and then we'll also have more information about the archeo archeological uh, excavation sessions, which everybody's free to, free to join. It's really a cool experience. Also have some of the archeological um, artifacts that have been excavated already on display in the exhibit. So can you remind us, Holly, when the new exhibit opens? The first day open to the public is Thursday, February 17, here at the Greeley History Museum.